In this episode, we are on a mission from God in devotion. This is The Digital Human. Train death reported Saturday by Nita Cecil, The Dallas Chronicle. A man in his late 40s was killed when he was struck by a train Saturday night, just after 9 p.m., in the area of First and Terminal Streets, according to the Dallas Police Department. I learned that he had died because people started messaging me asking if I knew whether he was alive. They started sending me screenshots claiming that he was dead based on a pretty pretty nebulous news report. The man's name was not being released pending notification of next of kin. There was probably a good 20, 30 people on the internet um, relay chat forums, and then somebody finally reached out to a uh, newspaper that reported about the almost person being hit. And then it was confirmed that it was Terry. There were no signs as of now that the man was intoxicated. Witnesses, quote, saw him straddle the rail, end quote. So I personally was heartbroken about his death. We really lost a beautiful mind. Okay, I'm going to start a new show. It's called Temple OS 5-Minute Random Code Walkthrough. And uh, I'm your host, Terry Davis. And uh, You, like me, uh, may never have heard of Terry Davis. He wasn't a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates. He died, homeless, on the 18th of August, 2018, in a little rural community with wheat fields and cherry orchards and, entirely unrelatedly, a huge Google data center close by. His story is worth telling because it says a lot about our attitudes to mental health. It also tries to discover where inspiration comes from and how creativity can be the saving grace for those who are deeply troubled. Tell us what you think on Twitter with the hashtag DigiHuman. Here's the deal. Uh... There are 130,000 lines of code. My name is Nita Cecil, and I'm a reporter with the Dallas Chronicle, which is a small, twice-weekly newspaper in north-central Oregon, USA. It was Nita who reported Terry's death, but her thought of it as a simple, if tragic, story soon went out the window as the phone began to ring and ring I was getting phone calls. My editor was getting phone calls. The police department got phone calls that they then referred to me. And I just went, oh, who is this guy? What we're going to do is use a uh, a random uh, number generator. This is the same generator that's from God. That Terry Davis was a programmer with uh, schizophrenia. He was somebody who believed that he was creating an operating system to talk to God. Uh, He was also someone who had something of a cult following, you might call it, on YouTube and live streaming. Jesse Hicks is a technology journalist, and he first wrote about Terry back in 2014. But Jesse saw something more beyond the simple story in Terry, and they continued to correspond for the next few years. The title of Jesse's article was God's Lonely Programmer. Oh, boy. I originally called him that because it seemed to be the way he thought of himself. He was somewhat fatalistic about having the operating system seen as what he believed it was. I described him as being lonely, but I think in a lot of ways he wasn't alone. He actually had a lot of people who were looking out for him, including his family, but also including many people that he had encountered on the Internet. It's called in the last um, path. People have never called in to confirm that someone has died. Never. One of the people, a woman, she says, I'm talking to people online right now, and they're just devastated that he's gone. And then this guy calls me from Australia, and he said he was afraid that people were just going to remember him for his mental illness and not for his, you know, huge achievement in computing. He said, you know, it's, it's hard for a layperson to understand what a phenomenal achievement it is to write an entire operating system single-handedly, you know, saying a person could build a house by himself, but this was like building a skyscraper by yourself. And that's when I went, whoa, okay, I get it. Terry called his software Temple OS. It is essentially a computer operating system like Mac OS or Windows on your laptop or iOS or Android on your phone. It is the most fundamental 
kind of software on your device because it interacts directly with the hardware. Something like Windows is over 50 million lines of code created over decades by hundreds of programmers working for one of the richest companies in the world. Temple OS was created by Terry on his own in just 10 years. And he was doing it for God. When it boots up, it looks something like a uh, probably early 1980s era operating system. Almost Atari-like graphics. Okay, we're going to go uh, try the Moses game. And then, of course, what sets it apart is the religious aspects. There's a random scripture generator. Oh, watch this. They'll do go- golden calf. You, you can then they, use uh, that as a way of talking to God. There's also an app that creates uh, religious songs in very primitive Atari-like sound. As a normal person coming into Temple OS, it would be hard to understand why it's technically impressive. And we will get to that because it's important. But you don't have to be a programmer to be awed by the devotion that Terry poured into his creation. It becomes their life's work. So literally, day and night, people will work on an idea, something that they feel compelled to create. So there's almost no limits to it. And as a psychologist, um, Victoria Tischler is professor of arts and health and the head of dementia care at the University of West London. She has a particular interest in creativity and the sort of mental health problems experienced by people like Terry. The degree of commitment that he demonstrated in creating Temple OS is something that fascinates her. People with schizophrenia, it may be characterized by things like delusions of grandeur, where they feel like they're being communicated with via higher powers like God, or they think they're God or a king. But I think often people feel like they're getting special messages and they need to act on those messages. And there may be an urgency to that. He really does emphasize how much he believes this makes him a prophet to be producing this operating system. If you go and talk to the people on the programming forums he was on, you see him going back and forth. And when they say, why did you do it this way? He would say, well, that's what God told me to do. And it turns out that God is a hell of a programmer. My name's Darren Clark. I'm a software developer. I've been a professional software developer for over 20 years. Originally, it was just um, kind of cruising through Reddit, um, some of the programming forums, and I'd occasionally come across one of his posts or something. One of my hobbies is doing reverse engineering of um, computer hardware, and having that direct access is something that's very unique in Temple OS. That's what makes it really powerful for reverse engineering. So his most important principle was that anyone can write a million lines of code. That's Kenneth Malick, another devotee of Terry's approach to programming. But it takes a really good programmer to make something that's simple yet accomplishes a lot. His goal was to keep it under 100,000 lines of code. So the fact that he was able to do this kind of shows his level of ability. You know, that philosophy is kind of the most important one. People like Kenneth and Darren bonded with Terry over what he'd created. And while they might not have shared his religious views about it, they couldn't help but admire his skill and his dedication. When conversing with Terry on a technical basis, he was calm, professional, and you'd never really realize you're talking to somebody that had an illness. Conversations were well thought out. When people are engaged in in a meaningful activity or something creative, they become very, very lucid in a way that they're unable to be in other sort of regular human interactions. Creative activity, which involves a synchronicity of the physical body and the mind, can be deeply therapeutic. So that if they're engaging in behaviour like calling out or where they feel very agitated, they're actually sitting and focusing and working on something that can be really beneficial for the individual where everything else in their life perhaps feels a bit out of control. Terry was clearly highly intelligent. So, you know, I'm not surprised at all that the one place where he felt he, you know, he was really able to be himself was in this um, complex programming world. He would often sound very lucid in conversation until he might mention that you might have been sent by the CIA. 
uh, in this paranoid, schizophrenic way that he had. After reporting on Terry's death and discovering that he had a following, Nita Cecil had one more surprise in store. Her telephone conversations with Terry's devotees began to take an unexpected turn. One of the phone calls I got was from a woman in Phoenix. She told me her first name, uh, but she didn't want to use her last name because she couldn't be associated with him. He uh, had been kicked off of YouTube a number of times because he would say such controversial things, racist, homophobic things. She picked the to call herself blue, and she said that that's actually a significant color to Terry. He was a remarkable programmer, but it was also clear that he was not a well man. Temple OS had helped to steady the ship, but his illness would still creep in. I'm literally the smartest programmer that has ever lived. When angry or, or confused, he tended to lash out with uh, the N-word, followed by CIA or CIA N-word. The words themselves were deeply racist. Here's what you do. Go to my website. I think... If you listen to when those kinds of words came out, they came primarily from being afraid and from being paranoid. A lot of what Terry said uh, when he was ranting um, is really disgusting. I didn't want to wind him up. I didn't want to hear his rants. I wanted to keep him focused on the technical stuff. Those early responses actually were fairly careful. People were willing to work with him and, and respect what he was trying to do and think about his mental illness as something to be overcome. Mental illness does not give you an automatic pass to say something racist or homophobic. But the context of how Terry would use this language is important. And while it still made the people around him deeply uncomfortable, more than one of them has described Terry's outbursts as almost involuntary responses. Psychologist Victoria Tischler. It seems unlikely that Terry was inherently, um, uh, you know, a violent or racist person. But through his illness, some of these antisocial behaviours became apparent. And that's something really common to people with severe mental health problems. They become very socially isolated for that very reason. I know from his family background, they were people who thought about social justice, racial justice, all of that. And, and even when Terry had one of his first breakdowns, when he returned, the thing that he wanted to do was try to help the poor people of Juarez, Mexico. Terry had these two sides. Temple OS was a feat of technical brilliance, but this was balanced against Terry's mental health. And more broadly, separating the value of the creation from the flaws of the creator is something that we struggle with right now. There's music and movies that are now wiped from our popular culture because artists' crimes are ultimately revealed. It's a tension that someone like Victoria Tischler has had to personally confront in her study of art and mental illness. If I had to choose one of my favourites, it would probably be a Swiss artist called Adolf Wolfli. Wolfli was someone who grew up in really adverse circumstances in Switzerland, was uneducated, and then got involved in a series of quite horrendous, violent crimes and spent most of his life incarcerated in the Waldau Clinic. He was encouraged to make artwork by his um, psychiatrist, who was a man called Walter Morgenthaler. And that work now is kind of acknowledged to be, you know, a masterpiece. I acknowledge that somebody may do awful things, but I also acknowledge that that person is a human being who's struggling with an illness. It doesn't excuse any bad behaviour, but I suppose a lot of my career I've been interested in helping people who perhaps are not able to access the resources that most of us take for granted. Victoria is attracted to this kind of art's communicative power. Artistic creation provides the possibility of of creating a, a really meaningful connection and communication for people who might struggle. So some of the difficult behaviours that Terry exhibited maybe were about frustration that he was unable to communicate with other people in the way that he perhaps wanted to. So maybe we shouldn't think of Temple OS as a technical achievement. Perhaps it is an artistic one. As far as whether Terry considered these things artistic pursuits, it wasn't something that he talked about in a way that would divorce it from what he was doing to, to speak to God. I suppose it's also important to underscore that he was trying to give it to the world. And I think the 
artistic aspects of it were part of his way of trying to entice the world to take up this project. We should point out we are not the only ones who've considered Temple OS to be art. It was actually exhibited in a French gallery as a digital example of something called outsider art. But what does that mean? Outsider art has a quite a, a lengthy and contested history. There was a French artist called Jean de Buffet who coined the term art brut, which loosely means raw art, art which is created outside of the mainstream art world. Um, we know de Buffet travelled around Europe visiting prisons and hospitals, collecting artwork made by prisoners and people in asylums. Often the people who make the work don't consider themselves artists in the slightest. There's been a number of cases where these incredible bodies of work have been discovered only after someone has passed away. Often these makers tend to be characterised by being very private, very eccentric, perhaps solitary, but perhaps united by having a, a really a compulsion or a vision to create something. Terry would be considered what we would call a visionary artist, so somebody who has an idea for a complete universe. So he had this enormous, you know, not just had the ideas, but spent a whole decade creating what is a system which has been acknowledged by his um, computing peers. So the building is uh, tw uh, 26 meters long, 12 meters large, and nearly 12 meters high uh, on the top. Outsider art comes in all shapes and sizes. I'm Frédéric Legros, the director of the Palais Idéal du Facteur Cheval. That translates as the ideal palace of the postman Ferdinand Cheval. And it's an icon of outsider art. We are in uh, Autrive. Uh, Autrive is uh, uh, a small village, one hour from Lyon. Now we are in, uh, in front of uh, the first side that the, the Facteur Cheval built with uh, three giant uh, Caesar, Vercingetorix and Archimede. And it is a kind of mix of many cultures. We have uh, like a big temple of Cambodia, but uh, some other oriental uh, reference. The Palais uh, Ideal is another example of someone devoting themselves to a project that those around them struggle to understand. The story goes that back in 1879, Ferdinand Cheval was out on his 32-kilometer post round when he tripped over a stone. Somehow, the stone reminded him of a dream he had had about building a palace. And so he built one with this stone at its heart. And the mishmash of cultures and styles that this palais includes come from the pictures and the postcards that he delivered on his rounds. I think that's lovely. He was dreaming a lot about this, dreaming of other of over country, of other of culture. And it became real. It became a castle like this after 33 years of work. Quite an achievement for somebody with no training in any of the skills required. Many of the stones used in the Palais' construction were found on that post round. It actually got to the point where Ferdinand had to take a wheelbarrow with him when he set out. So now we are in the gallery, which is really inside the Palais Ideal. You are really inside the universe of uh, Ferdinand Cheval. It also have some of uh, the most beautiful sentences of uh, the factor, like, uh, sorry, I have to translate it. This stone one day will say many things. <laughs> and what Ferdinand Cheval was communicating with his palais was a message of universal brotherhood across every culture. But back to Terry Davis. Today, we don't have to spend a lifetime building a monument in stone or in computer code to get our message out. We can do what Terry did next. A lot of the posting he was doing early on, he was medicated, so he was fairly lucid. Later, though, Terry was becoming more and more invested in live streaming. He also went off his medication and became much harder for his family to take care of. The kind of violent outbursts and the use of racist language, that all escalated. And eventually, his family, which they were not supported at all, really, by any kind of mental health institutions, they weren't able to take care of him anymore. 
So he packed up a van and went on what they, they call his big adventure. And before long, Terry's only social contact was with the people on the internet. There were still people who watched his live streams because they respected his technical ability. But it also attracted another audience, which was people who wanted to come and, and watch somebody be mentally ill on camera. He gained a lot of popularity through that because of his, because of what he said, how he acted. And people would go on there, provoke him, try and get a rise out of him, try and wind him up a little bit for their own entertainment. He really stopped developing Temple OS. He focused more on his popularity then on the internet. And as Terry neglected the project that had kept the worst of his illness at bay, he came to the attention of one of the most notorious communities of trolls and bullies online. I think it's not too surprising that 4chan would pick up on somebody like Terry Davis. They troll people and they kind of have no regard for anybody or anything. Um, But they also did things like empty his PayPal account. So you have, on one hand, people who were watching his live stream and respected his technical ability and wanted to help him, sending him money via PayPal. And then you have this other group of people that are kind of conning him out of it. And then that's creating all of this drama around him. Uh, He really was kind of in the middle of a push and pull as far as the good side of the internet and the bad side. Terry, me, uh, there's just something not right about my reality. At its uh, worst, Terry was the victim of all sorts of sickening emotional and psychological abuse as people toyed with him in the hope that he might say something even more outrageous. Hey, what if I'm like in a bubble and there's cameras? And as they did, Terry's grip on reality gradually began to weaken even further what my reality is, you know what I mean? But there were those who did what they could to help him. Kenneth Malik was one of them. I had proposed funding a care package comprised of food, uh, essentials like soap, shavers, etc., and that I could deliver this to him while he was homeless in San Diego. For Kenneth, it was a significant meeting, and he took the opportunity to interview Terry, who, despite his situation, was happy to share his unique take on programming with a fan. Well, yeah, I'm kind of hopeful that, I'm hopeful that someday, like, you know, on Musk or somebody's going to... He said something about, um, and this is fairly technical, he said something about little Indian versus big Indian. No, you're not wrong. He is talking about Endians, the two tribes of egg eaters in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Computer programming is full of these kinds of literary references. Which I found completely brilliant. And that conversation really struck out to me as something being a uniquely Terry thought. Five months later, and a thousand miles north, Terry's story came to an end in the little town of the Dallas, Oregon. When he... Um, removed a lot of his content from YouTube, except for his one last video. I knew something had happened, and I had a really bad feeling about the video. And then on one of the internet um, relay chat forums, somebody mentioned that a homeless person had been hit by a train, and I kind of felt that may have been him. We had a meeting after he had passed to discuss how we're going to handle his legacy. And it was kind of that that last IRC meeting, I think was the last time a lot of us got together. I think the legacy is Temple OS. Yeah, that's that's the that's the that's the Terry that I want to remember is the the technical Terry. But unfortunately there's there's a lot of reminders on the internet of the ugly side of Terry too. Dealing with that, that's that's what I really haven't reconciled. You know, a lot of artists have done crazy things, but they've created beautiful works of art, and a lot of people dismiss a lot of the things that they said because it's simply not relevant. You know, this was a person that contributed so much in a way that wasn't, you know, let's say business-minded, academia-minded. It was really its own thing. 
What Victoria Tischler finds so valuable in the work of neurodiverse creators, and that's the preferred term for outsider artists, and we're including Terry in this, is that their creativity is characterized by unconventionality and wild abandon. When children are born, they're naturally playful and creative, and then they get into uh, mainstream education where they're told to do things in a in a particular way, you know, and they become quite self-conscious and self-aware. But if one is diagnosed with a mental health condition or if one develops dementia, for example, somehow that is removed. There's a disinhibition, there's a liberation, which can be then a fount of creative expression, which is quite a positive way of looking at things which are normally seen as quite negative. Not that we want to romanticize mental illness or expect everyone with mental health problems to create a masterpiece, but clearly for Terry, his illness was a part of him. And for good and for bad, it gave him the inspiration to build an operating system for God. He had visions of how things should work that most people wouldn't. I mean, most, most people in computer science, they've been told this is how computers work. I think his illness allowed him to to explore those different perspectives. Um, He had a different look on how things should be done. And who knows what might spring from someone stumbling across Temple OS and finding something valuable in its uniqueness. Frédéric Legros is the director of Ferdinand Cheval's Palais Ideal. Picasso came many times in Autriva, in fact. Picasso was really interested by this kind of purity of art. So uh, there is this idea of uh, pure creation also. You, like me, may never have heard of Terry Davis. And perhaps until this program, you'd never heard of Ferdinand Cheval. But you've definitely heard of Pablo Picasso, who counted the Palais as an inspiration. I really like this library. Just come here and use their computer and uh, smoke out. Terry Davis wasn't defined solely by his mental illness. I think as a person, he was really genuine and charming and caring. And he was also really funny, even at that point when he was not totally lucid. He had a lot to offer the world, and he tried to do that in, in the best way he knew how. Maybe. I think uh, maybe I'm just like a little bizarre little person who walks back and forth. Whatever, you know. (laughs) This has been The Digital Human. For more on what went into today's program, you can visit us at thedigitalhuman.tumblr.com and on the Radio 4 website. Bye for now.